Well, thank you, Ariane, and good morning, everyone. It's exciting to hear from Bill Gerstenmeier and his team at NASA about the things going on in the International Space Station. And it's also great to be back here in Las Cruces with an opportunity to engage with so many friends and colleagues at this very special gathering. Even though there are a lot of space conferences on the calendar these days, I think ISPCS really stands alone in terms of its breadth, its depth, and its focus on commercial space. As most of you know, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation has a two-fold mi statutory mission. Our primary focus is on ensuring public safety during commercial launch and reentry activities, making sure that the members of the uninvolved public are not harmed in any way during licensed or permitted operations. But there's a second part of our mission, which is also very important, and that is to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space transportation. Whether you realize it or not, in today's environment, becoming a government regulator tends not to be a career ambition that is frequently aspired to by the next generation of aerospace workers. You see, one of the many duties of a government regulator is to write regulations on those rare occasions when there's a need to do so. And as we all know, regulations can be bad. They can impose unnecessary constraints on the private sector, stifle innovation, and result in significant cost increases. At least that's what some people seem to think. But it doesn't have to be that way. This morning I'd like to talk about a different kind of regulatory framework one that isn't burdensome for industry, but which instead actually helps companies to be more successful by reducing regulatory uncertainty, incorporating common sense business practices, leveling the playing field with international competitors, and lowering the risk of catastrophic losses. Before I address how we can do that for the space industry, Let's take a look at a different mode of transportation, motor vehicles. The Census Bureau says that in 2014, there were about 253 million people living in the US who were 16 years of age or older. And according to the Department of Transportation's Bureau of Transportation Statistics, in that same year, the most recent year for which data are available, there were a total of more than 260 million motor vehicles registered in the U.S., including passenger cars, motorcycles, trucks, and buses. So believe it or not, there are more registered vehicles in this country than there are people who are old enough to drive them. Pretty amazing. Think for a minute about what has to be in place before you can legally drive one of those vehicles across town for some authentic New Mexican cuisine after the panel sessions finish up this afternoon. First of all, you have to have a driver's license, which in most states requires passing a written exam on traffic signs, motor vehicle laws, and safe driving practices. What are some of those safe driving practices? Not exceeding the speed limits, observing rights of way, using proper procedures for turning or changing lanes, not tailgating, sharing the road with cyclists and pedestrians, and avoiding distracted driving or other dangerous driving behaviors. You will also have had to have successfully taken a driving test and to have had a vision screening exam. The car must be registered, have a current set of license plates, and have completed an annual safety inspection that included checks of its tires, brakes, headlights and taillights, turn signals, mirrors, horn, and windshield wipers. And you have to have proof of insurance or have paid a $500 uninsured motor vehicle fee. So that's the regulatory framework for driving a car. Is that too burdensome and bureaucratic? Well, maybe, maybe not. 
but it seems to be a system that most of us have gotten used to over the years, a system that millions of people are able to navigate successfully while still enjoying the freedom of being able to go where you want to go when you want to go there. At the same time, in spite of continued improvements in vehicle safety, more than 35,000 people were killed on U.S. roads last year, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. That figure represents a 7.2% increase over the previous year, the largest percentage increase in motor vehicle deaths in the last 50 years, possibly a result of more and more people trying to send or receive texts while they're, they are behind the wheel. So what does the regulatory framework look like for commercial activities in space? Well, when it comes to on-orbit safety, right now it's pretty much the Wild West. As you may be aware, Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which was drafted back in 1966, and which has now been ratified by more than 100 different countries, states that the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. So how do we do that currently? There are actually a number of different agencies involved. The FAA licenses commercial launches and re-entries, but nothing in between. The FCC licenses radio broadcasts from space, such as for telecommunication satellites. NOAA licenses commercial remote sensing activities, things like taking pictures of the Earth. NASA and DOD are obviously major players in space, but they're not regulatory agencies, and they have no desire to take on that role. So what we are struggling with right now is, what should we do with some of the proposals for new non-traditional operations in space? Things like commercial space stations, satellite servicing, lunar bases, and asteroid mining. If the United States is going to be seen as being compliant with its obligations under the Outer Space Treaty, somebody is going to have to oversee those operations. So the first question we need to answer is, who should that be? As the State Department has recently acknowledged, our current regulatory framework really wasn't designed to handle those kinds of non-traditional space operations. Given our statutory mission to encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space transportation, the FAA has expressed its willingness to take on the responsibility for overseeing commercial activities in space that are not already regulated by the FCC or NOAA should the White House and the Congress decide that that would be appropriate. What would that look like? Well, the goal would be to enable those new non-traditional commercial operations in space without creating a huge new regulatory burden that would make U.S. companies less competitive, or in the worst case, would drive them offshore in search of a more business-friendly regulatory environment. We think that could be done quite easily by allowing the FAA to issue a mission license or mission authorization. Such an approach would remove the regulatory uncertainty that several of the forward-looking and entrepreneurial companies are currently facing while still ensuring that we are compliant with our international treaty obligations. Fortunately, the issue appears to have recently gotten some traction in the Congress as part of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act that was signed into law last November. The Office of Science and Technology Policy was directed to assess current and proposed commercial activities in space, identify appropriate authorization and supervision authorities, and recommend an authorization approach. That has now been accomplished with OSTP Director Dr. John Holdren submitting a report to Congress on April 4th of this year. Under the recommended approach, the Secretary of Transportation, and by delegation, the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, would be allowed to grant authorizations for missions in outer space, consistent with international obligations, foreign policy, and national security interests of the United States, and 
U.S. government uses of outer space. The overall evaluation would be modeled on the existing FAA payload review process. An authorization would not be required either for government activities or for missions already licensed by the FCC or NOAA. Should Congress decide to approve the proposed legislation, all of those forward-looking entrepreneurial companies that have been eagerly anticipating being able to operate in space would no longer be in limbo and they could proceed with their development efforts, confident that the federal government would not decide to pull the plug or call a hold during the last minutes of a countdown. There are a number of U.S. firms that would benefit from resolving this issue, so I'm hopeful that Congress can come to a final decision in the next few months. Another issue that urgently needs our attention has to do with the safety of objects on orbit. A few months ago, there was an article in the Washington Post which reported that the cupola on the International Space Station, where the astronauts like to hang out during their free time to watch the world go by, now has a rather substantial chip in one of its picture windows. Fortunately, there are actually four panes of glass separating the crew members from the unforgiving vacuum of space. But NASA has had to regularly command the ISS to make orbit changes to stay out of the way of potentially lethal pieces of space debris. And there have been several occasions when the astronauts had to retreat to their Soyuz lifeboats to wait out a predicted close approach when a collision warning ended up being received without enough time to perform an avoidance maneuver. When it comes to assessing the space environment today and trying to come up with solutions to the rapidly increasing level of orbital debris, I think we really have a good news, bad news story. The good news is there has never been a time when there was a greater understanding and more appreciation of the congested nature of space. Based on developments like the Chinese ASAT test the Iridium Cosmos Collision, the popularity of the movie Gravity, the proliferation of CubeSats, and the announcement of plans for huge constellations in LEO, we are seeing a lot of great discussions taking place about some of the implications of these developments and the challenges associated with responding to them. The bad news is, even though we have been debating some of these issues for a number of years, certainly since before the publication of the National Space Policy in June of 2010, we haven't had a lot of final decisions being made, and we haven't seen a lot of definitive actions taken in response to the issues that have been raised. Orbital debris experts tell us that action is urgently needed to respond to the increasing congestion in outer space, both to prevent future collisions and to preserve the space environment for future users. While the Air Force is currently doing a fantastic job of tracking objects in space and sending out collision avoidance warnings as needed, our nation's senior military leadership has been very clear. They believe that the Department of Defense needs to be focusing its time and resources on national security challenges in space, being space warriors, if you will, rather than space traffic cops. So the question we need to deal with is, is it feasible for a civil agency, such as the FAA, to process and release safety-related space situational awareness data consistent with the national security interests and public safety obligations of the United States? Congress asked us that very question last fall as part of the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, and we have been looking at the issue very carefully ever since. After many months of working with our Air Force partners at the JSPOC, at STRATCOM, at Pentagon, and following some preliminary discussions with industry, our answer to that question is, yes, it would be very feasible to do that. So that was our response that we incorporated in the report to Congress that was signed out by the Secretary of Transportation just last month. In terms of where we go from here, we hope to start right away working closely with our partners at the Department of Defense 
to develop an implementation plan that would transition responsibility for collecting and disseminating safety-related space situational awareness data from the Air Force to the FAA. We would want to accomplish that transition as soon as possible, but to do that in a crawl, walk, run manner so that all of the key stakeholders are comfortable with the approaches being used, with the progress that is being made, and with the products and services that are provided. We think that such a move could be made in a surprisingly short period of time and with a relatively modest impact in terms of the necessary resources. To the extent that there are remaining questions about cost, schedule, or the accuracy of the data that is needed, we think that those could be answered by jointly conducting a six to nine month pilot program that would operate in parallel with existing collision avoidance warning process, such as the one being used by the JSPOC. If we can come to an agreement that this is the right direction to proceed, then we just need three things. First, authority to process and release safety-related SSA data, just like the DOD has today. Second, immunity from lawsuits, again, just like DOD has today. And third, the necessary resources to accomplish this mission. The FAA has already started working with OSTP and DOD to figure out what a civil space traffic management system would look like. Our goal would be to enhance the safety of space operations and preserve the space environment. We would expect to work cooperatively with existing SAA, SSA architectures in terms of sharing data and capabilities, wherever that makes sense, while retaining the ability to function independently to provide resiliency. We would want to maximize the use of commercial capabilities in order to take advantage of the potential for lower cost, increased innovation, and greater responsiveness to customer needs. We would also want to exhibit the attributes of a learning organization, continuously taking advantage of new ideas and new technologies that might originate in academia or, for, or from other sources. We anticipate that the overall transition would be accomplished in phases. The first phase would focus on data sharing and transparency. The objective would be to demonstrate the feasibility of providing orbital safety support services to selected civil, commercial, and international users under reasonable fiscal constraints and in a way that demonstrates the ability to protect national security interests. One option would be to start with the DOD and FAA collaborating on a civil STM pilot program that would address the challenges associated with small satellites and small satellite constellations. It seems like every week we're hearing about plans for a new mega constellation of small sats that will consist of hundreds or even thousands of satellites. Because of their size, the satellites themselves can be difficult to track and they are frequently not maneuverable. At the same time, because they are intentionally designed to be low cost, most of these satellites have limited or no redundancy and only marginal reliability. As a result, many systems end up becoming space junk shortly after they are launched. So if we want to be responsible stewards of the space environment, we need to think about how we can allow these systems to operate in space while ensuring that they do not become hazards to other space operators. The second phase of the civil space traffic management system would mature and expand the operation to encompass all non-military customers and orbital regimes. We would also reach out to key stakeholders, both nationally and internationally, to begin developing safety-related norms and standards. The third phase would provide full operational capability. If satellite operators were satisfied with the accuracy and responsiveness of the services provided by the new system, the DOD could begin phasing out its non-national security information sharing and focus exclusively on military missions in space. At the same time, we would anticipate that the FAA and the DOD would continue to work closely together, sharing observations and other data as appropriate 
and providing operational support to one another if needed. So that's our plan. We're very excited about the prospect of taking on this important new responsibility. And we're open to feedback from the entire aerospace community on how we can make this effort successful. In fact, we will be holding an industry day in Washington, DC on the morning of October 25th, right before the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee meeting, to share a little bit more about our thinking and to start soliciting your ideas. The meeting is being jointly sponsored by the Satellite Industry Association and the Commercial Space Flight Federation. I hope you will be able to join us. I look forward to answering your questions, but I think we're going to roll those all together with those from the next two speakers on STM so that we can have a good panel discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>